how can we reduce this problem for wildlife so that both people and wildlife can move safely? Um, and through this project, we're hoping to identify places that are the biggest problem for wildlife and work with you and your communities um, to come up with creative solutions. So um, this is a partnership project uh, with Maine Audubon. Um, it also includes um, Dr. Fraser Schilling, um, who's um, director at the University of California Davis Road Center. They're sort of the wizards behind the um, web site technology um, and help us with data analysis. And then Inland Fishery and Wildlife. And today you're going to meet um, Chuck Holsey, who's the regional biologist up in the western part of mountains part of the state. And then um, Maine DOT is also very interested in this information and a partner on the project. And uh, Richard Bosswick's in the environmental office. Um, I want to um, tell you Maine Audubon is a nonprofit conservation organization that works to conserve Maine's wildlife and wildlife habitat by engaging people of all ages in education, conservation, and action. So a little plug, if you're not a member, please consider joining. Um, your membership helps us do programs like this one. If you've got your webcam on at the moment, if you would please um, turn that piece off, that would be great. Um, I'm going to um, next tell you what we're covering today. We're going to start with why we're doing this project. Um, a little background on um, uh, the wildlife and um, the impacts. Um, and then Chuck's going to talk about identifying and learning more about the wildlife that you may encounter. Um, we'll go over how to survey your routes um, and, report, and then report your observations on the website and have time for questions um, and answers. And again, if you have questions along the way, go ahead and type them in and Amanda will feed them to me as we, as we go. Um, So why are we focusing up in this region with this statewide project that we already have? Um, we are going to, um, this, this area of the state has um, been identified by many different initiatives as being important. As you, if you look on the upper left part of your screen, you see the, the state of Maine with the kind of red areas. This is an analysis that was done about a human footprint um, and you can see kind of uh, where the more green areas are is um, areas where there's less development and roads. And so this, this is uh, an area that's uh, important for connectivity and movement of animals um, really internationally. Um, and it's also important for regional movement as um, the geographic range of animals um, shifts um, and we want to make sure that they can continue to um, move across the landscape to adjust to those geographic shifts. Um, that may be changing due to climate change and weather and t uh, temperature changing the habitats that are that are there. So animals are, you know, just their basic daily needs, food, water, shelter, rest, um, for nesting and breeding. The young need to be able to disperse and find new habitats as the adults kick them out of, out of their uh, native habitat where they've been born. Um, and then some animals need to move big distances, like the bobcat, who uses about 6,000 acres um, for its home range throughout one year. So that's a lot, a lot of ground to cover in a year. Do animals, uh, small animals, um, that move actually relatively uh, large distances for, for them? This is a spotted salamander. And an adult spotted uh, salamander has been um, shown to travel as much as 800 um, 20 feet between its breeding pools and then the adjacent non-breeding habitat in the uplands. And juvenile um, spotted salamanders have been documented to go um, as far as about a half a mile um, away from their breeding pool where they were born. Um, so that's a long way for a little animal. And of course, as they move, they have to get across roads. And sometimes it gets difficult. They can't get there from here. Um, road impacts are many. It's, it's uh, not just the roadkill, but it's also loss of habitat from where the road and associated development goes, the fragmentation of habitat, habitat avoidance, um, and again, of course, the co collisions. Um, movement um, is prevented um, through high levels of traffic. That's one of the one of the main causes, and also avoidance, um, and then high levels of roadkill. 
are also possibilities. And where a road occurs is also really important in terms of how much I'm um, going to have on wildlife or roadkill. Um, studies show that roads that are adjacent to or near water resources, such as wetlands, ponds, streams, rivers, um, have a substantially higher level of road vehicle collision roadkill um, than other stretches of roads. And, and this makes a lot of sense because we know that about 85% of Maine's vertebrate wildlife use habitat in or adjacent to these wet areas. So, so areas. where roads occur on the landscape really makes a difference to wildlife. Difference. Uh, the amount of traffic is also um, really relevant to, um, to wildlife. On the bottom right, a, a country road with not very much traffic. Um, you know, for most animals like deer and so on, it's not going to be a barrier. They're going to get across the majority of the time. It's not a problem. But for some animals, a road of low traffic like this can be a significant problem, for, such as for a turtle that's very slow mo moving um, and um, doesn't take too many um, uh, collisions that are fatal to do a, a real number on the population of turtles. And then on a high volume road like this highway, uh, when you get to about 10,000 vehicles a day on a road, um, studies are showing that it's a nearly complete barrier to wildlife movement. And that doesn't mean animals don't get across, they do. It's just that their odds are fairly low. Some animals won't be able to get across. And, and those that do, eventually their luck is probably going to run out um, and it, it's not going to be sustainable. So don't worry about all the details on this, but it's just to show that when you add all of these different issues together, the habitat loss, the road avoidance, the roadkill, um, these things end up making the population smaller and smaller, and eventually um, you may end up with population loss um, or extinction either locally or statewide, depending on the sensitivity of the animal. The most vulnerable animals are those that are really slow moving and have very low breeding success, like this wood turtle. Um, they, it, it's a long time before they're old enough to breed, uh, 10 years old or so, um, and, and most of the young don't survive. And um, very few make it to adulthood to be able to breed. So when one of them is taken out of the population through uh, roadkill or other means, um, it can do a real number on that population fairly quickly. Um, other animals that are vulnerable are those, again, that have to move a bit of a distance between their breeding and non-breeding habitats, putting them at risk of crossing roads. It is a big problem. Um, we know that vehicles are um, killing at least a million vertebrates a day in the United States. This is actually a study from 1987, so I would feel very comfortable doubling that number at this time um, because so many are, are not reported, they're cleaned up by scavengers and so forth, and we have a lot more traffic and roads now than we did then. We have, you know, billions of dollars of costs um, and, and injuries uh, from deer collisions. Um, in Maine, in a five-year period, we had 15, over 15,000 deer collisions and um, over 3,000 moose collisions. And birds are also actually killed on roads. Um, it's something that may not be intuitive because we think they can fly and avoid, but many times they're flying low across from maybe one wetland to another, um, or they're scavenging on the road, and, and it's, it's, a, it's an issue. So almost all animals are affected in some way. But there are solutions, and that's what this project is about, um, trying to figure out where. I mean, we all are familiar with the deer sangs. You get kind of numb to them and, and they end up not being very effective, um, but we need, to, we need to figure out where the problems are so we can come up with, with solutions. Um, the Behemoth Habitat Program is a uh, program that is a voluntary informational program, collaborative with all these different um, organizations, uh, the Inland Fishery and Wildlife and Maine Audubon and Department of Transportation and many others. Um, to share habitat information with communities for, for, for their planning. And Human Habitat gives out um, computer maps, and, and on that, one of them is about where are the large blocks of habitat um, without roads for, for communities to plan. Well, one of the pieces of information, of course, that we, it wasn't on the maps originally was how do animals get from one side of the road to another. And um, so 
um, Begin with Habitat started a uh, computer analysis of uh, 10 different species to represent the diversity of species in the state um, and identify through computer modeling where the highest hab value habitat might be on either side of the road for that animal. So here's an example. One of the animals was a fisher. We used the land cover, which is the area on the left, um, and we assigned using expert opinion and um, literature research, you know, where, what types of habitats are the best habitats for fisher and came up, put that together with um, nine other species, and came up with these areas that are now in the beginning with habitat maps, the blue and green, which are areas connecting habitats across roads between large blocks that may be areas worthy of um, trying to um, conserve and, and make sure that they are, their um, uh, connecting ability is maintained. But, um, but this was all done um, on the computers. So what we'd like to know is a little bit more about what's actually happening on the ground in some of those locations. So in this project, uh, we've identified these um, dark green stretches. There's um, eight different segments of roads up in the western mountains um, that we're assigning through this project. And each of those will have some of those beginning with habitat connectors on them um, that we'll get information about in the field. Um, they've also been um, a season of winter tracking has been done on six of those, the northernmost six of those routes. Um, and we're hoping to do some culvert surveys, find out how, um, what shape the culverts are and would they be usable for wildlife to move through them um, currently. And then this project will add another piece of information, what are volunteers seeing in terms of um, roadkill or roads or wildlife trying to get across the road even successfully. And through that, hoping to bring together um, all this information to have a co more comprehensive idea of how animals are moving and, and where the barriers might be for that movement. So answers we want through this project, verifying those beginning with habitat connectors, finding out where wildlife are crossing, what types of habitats, um, are there common types of habitats that we're seeing patterns for or road characteristics or hotspots where there's real concentration. Um, and, and it's way too many miles of road for biologists to cover and that's where you come in uh, needing volunteers to, to, that usually drive that route or go on that route to bring in a lot more data. Um, and we encourage you to uh, recruit your friends and neighbors and school groups to, um, to do this as well. Um, a little bit about the solutions. Uh, right now on our website, we're collecting a lot of data. We have points on the map. We have uh, information about, about um, each point. Um, that's just kind of raw information, very interesting. But then we need to be able to really um, do something with it. And this is some very preliminary analysis just to give you an idea of the kinds of things we might do. Um, the left is actually um, I-295, where there's been a lot of um, data collected by volunteers. And those red areas along the place are, are hot spots where there's been uh, concentrations of a lot of observations. So we just take, we're just getting a preliminary look at that and sort of start thinking about, well, what does that mean? The map on the right is um, someone's route um, down in southern Maine uh, who went out last year and did some regular surveys. And again, we're seeing densities of um, where the observations occurred. And we can start taking a look at what were the habitats there, what kind of species were there, can we can learn some things there. Just give you a little idea of, of uh, the data. So what we can do with it. One signs. These are interactive um, turtle crossing signs that are used in southern Maine where we have a couple different endangered species. And they're seasonal. They're flipped down most of the year and only flipped up when the turtles are active. And that really is uh, wonderful because it um, helps with people who might be um, sensitive or become less sensitive to the signage um, and makes it more uh, noticeable. There are also things such as uh, wildlife crossings. These are small crossings. Um, there's different kinds. These are. This is one down in Massachusetts that's been very successful for um, herptile, meaning um, a uh, amphibians like salamanders and frogs and turtles, for getting across a small road. This is de designed specifically for them. And you can see on the left the road with a grating on top. That um, allows in moisture and light, and studies have shown that those type of crossings versus a culvert um, that might have um, that has no top opening to it 
is much more effective, the ones that allow that light and moisture in. And they actually design these now with an engineering firm that are made um, specifically for roads um, and pass all the safety specs and, and so on. Um, so those can be effective if they're placed in the, in the right place. And that they're um, done with fencing. Fencing for any kind of wildlife crossing is critical to making them work. Um, it's what funnels the animals to that location. Otherwise, you, you put your investment in and then the animals still cross um, across the road. Um, the fencing funnels them in. The example up on the upper left is a, is a drainage pipe or a culvert that um, was enhanced by putting in this wildlife shelf for small critters to, to um, get through when the water's high. And that's another um, possibility in certain situations. In some areas of the country um, and internationally, they're doing very large wildlife crossings. These may or may not be appropriate, depends on your location. Um, anywhere from the bottom left, which is um, the Trans-Canada Highway up in Banff, uh, Canada. It's a green bridge. Um, it's built for wildlife to get across from one area of that um, you know, internationally important national park to another incredibly effective, along with fencing and keeping the large animals off the road. And um, uh, I think collisions have reduced 80 or 90 percent, uh, quite successful. But it can be a, um, a, 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 a overpass like the one on the upper left that's sort of over there and can enhance for wildlife, um, or an underpass that's built for wildlife, um, getting them across in critical areas. Another area that can really help um, wildlife are how we redesign our stream crossings. The one on the left is, is a really extreme perched culvert. It perhaps used to um, reach down to the water, but over time, has, as the power of the water has carved it down, and as you can see, um, animals would not be able to get up and over, uh, whether they be fish or small mammals. Um, and it, as we replace those, if we replace them with something like uh, the, the arch on the bottom right, uh, which retains some of that bank, uh, stream bank, um, animals can then um, either go in the water or along the shores and successfully um, get upstream. And as I was saying, so many animals move along waterways that, along with a little fencing, that could help a lot of critters stay off the road. Um, another um, technique is traffic calming just uh, putting in uh, speed bumps or making the roads sinuous or curvy. Uh, these are great in places where you're trying to keep the traffic slow for, for people safety as well as wildlife safety. And then um, we can use the information for land use and transportation planning, um, thinking about you know where's the traffic volume going to get high? Does this make sense? Is this a sensitive wildlife area? What should we do in that situation? Um, or um, if it's a successful crossing area and the traffic's not going to be very high, can we keep the area across uh, near the crossing uh, undeveloped um, permanently so that it can uh, continue to function that way? And just um, as we know, we've got about 23,000 miles of roads in Maine. About a third of them are the responsibility of the state, Maine DOT, um, but two thirds of them are the responsibility of towns and private owners. So there's a lot of um, decisions that get made on the on the local level as well. Um, and in the DOT, um, there's opportunity for this data to help them with their project planning and scoping. If they look at corridors, they create plans every two and six years. They can take a look at this information and, and it can be uh, as one of the pieces they look at. Towns do open space plans, um, protection areas, road standards. Again, those are areas where this information could be helpful over time. So we'll share back what we learned to you and your community, as well as our partners. And um, look forward to um, working with you on, on the data collection. I'm going to, that's um, the introduction. Any questions on that before we move on to Chuck and learn a little bit about the animals that um, you may see um, um, as you're out there looking for wildlife? And, we're, and Amanda's switching us over to another program, but go ahead and type in your questions um, um, if you have any.
Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Chuck Halsey. I'm a regional wildlife biologist. I've been in the Western Maine area for 25 years. Uh, the uh, wildlife division has seven regional offices, and the other biologist and I cover an area that would be defined if you drew a line from Bethel to Skowhegan to Colvin Gore to the Forks. And uh, we have 115 or so organized towns and townships in that area. And our job in the region, both myself and the other biologists, is to really to administer and implement all the department's wildlife programs that occur in that geographic area. So that's what I do. Uh, this is my first webinar. I've never taken a webinar course. And this is my first being associated with a webinar course. I'm very excited about it. Um, and I'm going to discuss a little bit about the wildlife species you are likely to encounter on the roads that are part of the survey in this area in their, rel in their relative abundance. Also, can you hear me now? Still here? Yeah, and also say this: it's uh, I've known Barbara from uh, going to conferences with her, and it's a pleasure to be able to work directly with Maine Audubon. I don't think I've had that opportunity before. It's really wonderful having you here today with us. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So I think that also needs to be in. Okay, so you're good up there. All right. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to identify species and certain species, and the, and with some of them, the general habitat should find them in. And so there are various ways to identify an animal: its shape, its size, its color. With behavior, tracks, scat. Let me give you an example of behavior. Uh, we, we often investigate unusual wildlife sightings. One way to tell if something is a feline or a canid, if you follow the tracks long enough, cats like to sit and ambush things. So if you follow a tracks, so you're not sure what it is for a period of time, you eventually see where a cat will sit down and watch where things go. As most other animals just are on the go nonstop. So that's where behavior would come in. So the occurrence of roadside wildlife is going to be affected by <clears throat> the habitats associated with that section of road, the season, age of the animal, sex of the animal. So let's talk about the cats to start with. In that area of those surveys, uh, bobcat would be common. Uh, and one way to tell the physical features of feline, um, they have retractable claws. They have a leading middle toe. They're put the the the, the track has a much higher percentage of hair between the pads versus the key, the feline. So if you saw an animal cross the road and you weren't really sure what it was, you could stop, see if there are tracks, and that might be helpful to you. If it was in the winter, such a survey would be as, almost a slam dunk. You'd, have, you'd absolutely be able to see tracks. And the top track there shows an asymmetrical pattern of a feline track, and the bottom track is more symmetrical for a canid. So just to give you kind of an idea of the relative difference in sizes of these tracks, a house cat would be the size of a golf ball, a bobcat the size of a tennis ball, a lynx the size of a baseball, and a mountain lion the size of a softball. We do have lynx in the area. Uh, they're, I'm not sure I want to say rare. They're certainly uncommon. They, based on the 
the number of credible reports, I would say there's a slight upward trend in links through that area. And one nice thing about links, for some reason, they tend to be an animal that lingers and doesn't mind being watched a little bit from all the reports I've ever received from people. That you probably have a better chance of having a link stop and let you look at it than a bobcat. They have feet that, if, so if you saw an animal go by, I'm going to go backwards. If you saw an animal go by, their feet are ridiculously big and their legs are ridiculously long. That's, I mean, much, exponentially more than a bobcat. <clears throat> they actually weigh about the same, though a lynx appears to be a lot bigger. But in actuality, it's not. Though it is a little tall. It is taller. One of the nice things about lynx versus bobcat, we've been given a really nice way to tell the difference. And one is a lynx, the tail looks like it's been dipped in ink. The black is all the way around the tip, and it has very long ear tufts. So I would say a lynx is a relatively easy animal to identify. Um, compared to bobcat, the tufts are much shorter. Uh, legs are much shorter. And the black on the tail is only partial partial black tip on the tail. And that's relatively easy to see, even from a distance. And very easy to see if you have binoculars. Now to the to the canine family. Their physical features are they don't have retractable claws. When I the nail drives under the substrate means that as a foot punches through it, the then you can see the nails forward in the hole. Like I said before, they have a symmetrical track shape. And here's the thing that makes we use this a lot. If you look at the graphic on the right, if you can draw an X right through the left toe pads down the right side of the heel pad and the mirror on the other. And we can tell canid versus feline even with very poor quality tracks. So again, if an animal goes across the road and you're not quite sure, stop and look and see if it made some tracks in the in the side of the road or some mud. Um, Barbara, this is not a winter survey, am I correct? Um. We're encouraging April through September, but if people are into it and are doing it year-round, that's fantastic. Okay, so um, that is a really good tip for telling canine, the canine family. And we use it all the time. That's probably the first thing we look at when we're trying to figure out what something is, is uh, can we draw an X through it? <clears throat> Another nice thing for telling feline versus a canid is, again, the pads take up a very high percentage of the whole track with a canine, and, and felines have far more hair in between. We call that area between the pads negative space. So the canine has a lot less negative space. It's not likely you would ever see a wolf, but I would never rule it out. Uh, we have interesting reports in that area. We're currently investigating one right now with, with uh, game cameras have been all winter, not very far from Canada with our owl wolves. Um, so it's plausible, but not likely. Again, wolves, kind of like lynx, really big feet, really long legs, very tall. If you have a lot of experience watching coyotes, then you can tell if you saw a wolf. It would really stand out. Uh, if you don't have a lot of experience observing coyotes, it would be difficult. Wide snout, short rounded short rounded ears. Coyote, very pointed snout, very pointed ears, much shorter legs. Both colors, a coyote can be gray, black, blonde. A wolf would be gray or black or something in between. And you would find uh, I'd like to back up just a little bit. I, I'm not going to go back to my slides, but if you look at habitat, the, the lynx is going to be entirely associated with younger spruce and fir forest. And the coyote, the bobcat would be a generalist, could be in any habitat. The coyote would be any habitat, including uh, even places where people live. 
Fox is also a generalist. You, you, we tend to think of them being just around fields and wood edges, but in reality, they're they're also found routinely out in the big woods where there are no fields. Uh, they're common, as are coyotes. Coyotes don't like to be seen. They're far shyer. Uh, fox doesn't seem to care that much if you see it. <clears throat> Very easy to tell by the fur. There's not much variation in color. Huge tail. Red, red color, black legs. If you see their track pattern, it's they're absolutely linear. You could pull a rope tight and line up all the tracks in one line. More so than any other animal. So even if you had poor quality tracks, they're all blown in with snow, or the sun has melted them out, or you don't have all the tracks. If you, if you can line them up like putting a rope between them and just pulling it tight and they all line up, that's a fox. They're also, they're also fairly small, small, small track. So the weasel family, also common in the area where you'd be looking. No wolverines, so they are a member of that family. I don't think you're going to see any wolverines. If you do document a wolverine, you'll be in the, you'll be in the national news that night. So the smallest ones we have is long-tailed weasels. They're um, voracious hunters. Uh, they need to be where there's some structure because they're very long and narrow. They don't hibernate. And if you're long and thin and narrow in Maine, you lose a lot of body heat. So they eat nonstop. They're a carnivore. They're not much. They basically want to kill what they eat. They will scavenge. But um, they're constantly on the move. They have the lowest percent body fat of any mammal name for point of interest. A lot of us um, are envious of that. They also change color in the, in the, in the winter. They're called ermine, but it's the same animal in the summer. A very small animal. I was asked recently, a person was having trouble with their chickens being killed by weasels, and they asked if a one-inch square mesh would keep them out. I told them I didn't know. I, I, I wouldn't dare to say if they could not. Yes, I know they could get through a one-inch square or not. I don't think they could, but I encourage the people to use a half-inch square because they are small, much smaller than you might think. The next cousin up, which is common in the area you're going to be surveying, is Martin. They're um, a <clears throat> little bigger. They're a brownish and a blondish color. They're, you can see that blonde on them pretty well and a little bit of a white face. They can be arboreal, but they spend most of their time on the ground. You're going to find them associated with spruce fir forest where there's lots of structure on the ground because they want to get under that. The structure holds up, provides, provides a cover for the animals that they're going to hunt, and it also provides protection from them from the cold. I do not have a picture of a fisher, even though it's a common animal. I just couldn't pull it together. They're probably three times the size of a martin. They're uniformly dark brown. They're called, you know, slang uh, black cat, fisher cat. They're not a cat, and they're in no way like a cat. But if you had, if you were looking directly into the sun and you were looking at a fisher, it might appear absolutely jet black to you. The brown is that dark brown color. You find them in mixed wood forests. They can handle openings better because they're not not—they're big enough to not be taken as prey by avian predators um, or, they're not, or coyotes or bobcat. In fact, you might find it interesting that on our lynx study up north that went on for several years, they, they documented fish are killing lynx. So they don't really, as an adult, have any enemies. So they can then venture into openings. Uh, they're going to be more likely to venture into an opening than a, um, than a, than a pine mountain wood or a weasel wood. <clears throat> and um, where you see snowshoe hair, if you pay attention as you're going along the road and you're seeing snowshoe hair sign, either droppings or tracks, you're very likely to find fisher and pine martin and coyote. Uh, and lynx in those places because that's what that's a very important part of their diet. 
their, one of their aquatic relatives that we have in that area is the mink, and they're abundant, they're common. You're really not going to find them away from streams, ponds, lake shores, brooks. So um, anytime you're crossing those types of places, you can uh, keep your eyes peeled. One year when I was deer hunting, I every morning I went down and sat on a bog, uh, this log over a bog, and I could almost set my clock to the time of the morning when this mink would come running down the, sh the shore. And I was up on this elevated log about six feet off the ground, and every time, every morning that week, he would run under that log like, almost within 15 minutes every every day. Or that was his, that's where he went shopping or she went shopping every morning for their food. So uh, they're very closely tied to an aquatic environment. Their big brother is the river otter. Not going to find them associated with streams, but you will find them associated with rivers, ponds, and lakes. Even though I'd call them common, I don't see them that often, but they're around. And um, again, only, you're only going to find them associated with an aquatic, is a, if a road intersects aquatic, an aquatic environment. You can often see them where they get coming in and out of the water up on the logs uh, and uh, up on, onto the ice and the snow, they leave trails in the snow because they like to slide. Just like it looks like on TV. I made up this family name. I made up this family name called Commodity, which is the commoners, because there's only really one in each, uh, one member of the family in name. Raccoon. I think you're all familiar with that, so I'm going to move right along. But they're common, maybe even abundant. Skunks, common to abundant. Snowshoe hair, also called the varying hair because it changes color. And uh, very closely associated with dense spruce fir, conifer, or mixed conifer, younger stands, stands that are 10 years old to 40 years old. Very, they, they require very low lateral visibility. Uh, in, in terms of being able to see through the cover, because their first line of defense is to sit still and let the, let the enemy walk by. That's why they change color. You wouldn't change, bother to change color if you were going to try to outrun everything. They run when the jig is up. So those young, those, those younger clear cuts that are 10 years old, up to 40 years old, low lateral visibility, I think that's what I was saying, and uh, if you keep an eye out for those types of forest stands and you and your survey routes, that's where you're going to find a lot of other species that rely on the snowshoe hare as a primary food source. <clears throat> the deer family, I know you're all familiar with deer. Um, there's the... <clears throat> Moose are common to abundant through the region, and you'll find moose, there's two ways that moose will be, you'll see them along the road. One will be a purely random event with a cross in the road, but during May, June, July, they frequent the roadsides because of an accumulation of salt in both the mud and the water and the plants that we put out during the winter so that we can drive 70 miles an hour a day after a 12-inch snowstorm. So in Maine, we put out a lot of salt. And moose uh, need salt, and they like salt. So watch out May, June, and July. If you're traveling those roads uh, any time of year, when you, but especially dawn and dusk, be extremely careful because there's lots of them beside the road. Oh, let me back up. They, outside of that, they're going to be associated with, also with young clear cuts, especially in the winter. Stands that have been cut five to 20 years ago. They're, they're about, in the, in the summer, they're, they feed on aquatic vegetation. The aquatic vegetation is very high in the minerals and nutrients that they need, especially cows, with calves. 
but they like deer, they become a browser of woody vegetation in the in the winter. So in the winter, the fall, winter, early spring, they're a browser. Other than that, they're they're more, more closely tied to aquatic an aquatic habitat. There's also two ways you can see deer near the road. One would be completely random events. The other is if, if you're from December to April. If you happen to be in an area where it's associated with a deer wintering area, deer numbers will be can be very, very high. Because uh, that's where they that's where all the deer go to winter in that particular stretch of or in that particular area. They're also very active crossing the roads during the rut. Which is late September to middle of November, uh, late November, where the the bucks especially are, cro are on the move nonstop, and so they're constantly crossing roads. And also in the spring, when they're all deer, when they're breaking out of those wintering areas, become more active crossing the roads. Thought I'd just touch upon some birds. Um, you're not going to see a pileated woodpecker sitting on the road, but you, I see them all the time flying across the road. I call them common in the area. Turkey numbers uh, uh, range from common to low to the northern to the more northern stretches of the road to be driving. The numbers would be low, but they do occur places where they never occurred before due to the department bringing them back to the state of Maine starting in the late 70s. And rough grouse are very common. You don't usually get to see a picture of them um, sitting on a nest. Um, but uh, you do see them walking beside the road. They like to walk beside the road to get grit. Because all birds need that. Hmm, those, the fonts on those are kind of small. So <clears throat> I, I told Barbara that reptiles and amphibians were not my not in my wheelhouse, they're not in my area of strength, but I do really like snakes. That's a water moccasin. I don't believe we have any in Maine, but that's the best snake picture I had on my C drive this morning. Uh, snakes are not common in the area. Um, I can, I've been there 25 years. I, I don't know that I've seen three snakes run over the road. But snakes that you could see would be the common goddess snake, and that's probably the most. That's probably the most most abundant. Towards the southern part of your roots, you could see a milk snake. Northern water snake, we have them, but never see them in the road. I see, I have seen them in some of our wetland areas. The ring neck, the red belly, and the green snake. Again, rarely ever see them in the road. So I would say it'd be unlikely for you to encounter snakes in the road in, the, in that in those areas. <clears throat> when Bobby first told me about this, I said I don't really think there's many snapping turtles in that survey area because we're, we're kind of at the end of the northern end of the range of snapping turtles. The next day, I was working with a district game one who worked up in Eustace and. Uh, he was also a state trooper for 10 years in that area. And he told me that he did see snapping turtles in Jim Pond Township, which is just beyond Eustace. Yeah. So that surprised me. So um, as you get down towards Farmington, you can see that's when you start seeing some snapping turtles. But And wood turtles, uh, they're state listed special concern, but there are some survey routes there where we, we do know we have wood turtles. I've never seen one in the road. Um, but I have encountered them along uh, some stretches of rivers in large wetlands. So we're certainly interested if you talk any way you document wood turtles. And here's a list. Here's a list of we consulted our I can Barbara and I consulted Philip Dimeniere, who is our heads up our group on. Uh, amphibians, reptiles, and vertebrates. And for, for your survey area, Philip relayed that he thought that there was a possibility of documenting mink frog, leopard frog, gray tree frog, spring salamander, and blue spotted salamander. Rare but possible. So if you encounter those, uh, be sure to take a picture. 
and uh, would be very, you know, be, be very interested in adding that to our database. So I'm going to talk, how am I on time? Great. I'm going to talk a little bit about making observations of wildlife using visual data only, with something you look at. It's, it's really tricky. Don't be afraid of seeing something and saying, I don't know what that is. It's much better if you're not sure to say, I don't know what it is. Uh, because there's lots of things that can come into play that make it difficult. And scale is a huge problem. You know, is it bigger than a bread box? If it's not next to something of a known size, it is very difficult to estimate its size. And I have handled um, 30 black bears that have been caught. They were in a COVID trap or a foot snare, and they had to be drugged. We have to calculate the drug dosage. And to a person, we all overestimate their size, even when you can have all day long to look at it. So um, size is a problem for every one of us. <clears throat> How big? And one of the things that come into play with causing problems for us human beings with size is if we get thrown a curve and we, we know how big something should be, and I asked you, how big is that Rapallo law on the left? And you would say, well, I know how big a Rapallo law is. I've seen them. Well, that's the same Rapallo law on the right. So it can, uh, it, pictures of things can be deceiving. Um, it's tough, so just be cautious when using uh, visual determination of how big something is. Color is also a problem because color varies on an animal based on its age, its sex, time of year, its, loca its geographic location, day versus night, and especially the position of the subject versus the light source. You've all seen professional photographers who've taken pictures of an animal that's in black silhouette that's because the sun, they were shooting into the sun. And uh, one time I saw, I was with another biologist, we were driving on this long stretch of road, dirt road, and you could see a long ways, and this animal came out into the road, and it was jet black. And it, we go, what is that? I mean, what the heck is that? And on this road, you could drive really fast. And we're looking into the sun. Neither one of us could figure out what it was because it was black. So we go, what could be black? It's not a bear. What is it? We're driving down the road about 55 miles an hour. The animal crosses, goes in the woods, comes around to the left, and comes around with the sun's on its back. It was just a blonde-colored coyote. It was a natural-colored coyote, light, light gray. But that animal went from black to light gray to only because of where the light was. So that's something I would share with you. Keep in mind where the light is if you're looking at what color it is. So with that, I'll ask if you have any questions. And go ahead and type in any questions on the um, keyboard if you do for Chuck. And then we'll start moving into um, how to go about conducting your surveys next. OK. And um, Chuck is here, so if questions mm -hmm. come up, um, he'll be here to, to answer questions um, in the end as well. Mm. Um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and start talking a little bit about um, how to go about doing your surveys. You will be um, sent, Amanda's going to send you some materials after um, you sign up for your route, one of which is going to be um, the, a map. Um, this is a draft right here but of, of one of the maps, um, Route 4. We'll be sent a map um, and data forms, um, as well as some written instructions, which are actually already currently on the website. Um, so equipment you're going to need. Um, we really recommend a uh, safety vest. And I think we're going to be able to actually, if you don't have one, send you one in the mail. Um, a digital camera, either, whether it's on your phone, or, or separately, that is um, very strongly encouraged. Uh, we really need pictures uh, when at all possible. 
Um, a cell phone is always good to have in case you have emergency. That's just a safety um, issue. Um, and have your map and data form along. Um, and then I also recommend for those of you who um, can, I have a little, on my phone, I have a, a, a voice recorder. I, got, I have a smartphone and I downloaded a free um, re voice recorder called the Easy Voice Recorder. Um, and when I'm driving and I can't stop, um, I can just push one button and, and make a recording of what it is I, I just saw. Um, we are going to encourage you to stop and, 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 and look at what you're seeing, um, but there are times I know when, when, you got, when you're maybe not on your regular survey and don't have the time. First thing, uh, safety. Um, we want to just really emphasize how important this is. Um, you will be on roads, um, other people not knowing you're doing surveys. Um, if you're on an interstate or the road's extremely busy um, or um, cars are coming in and out, don't stop. Um, you should be able to pull completely off the road um, so other gar cars can get by easily um, and, um, and you should have no difficulty getting back on the road um, if you're doing your surveys by driving. Um, if you're walking and biking, again, wear a safety vest, um, wear light colored clothing. Remember, black clothing, just you're not seen by vehicles um, when it's dark out, if you're in dark clothing. Um, so again, please be safe. Um, if you don't feel safe, then, then don't stop. Uh, frequency, we are um, hoping people can commit to at least once a month from April through September. If you can do it more frequently, your route, um, that's fantastic. Um, we're really trying to get as much data. What we really need is high volume of, in, of observations in order to start doing analysis. So if this is your everyday route and you want to do it more frequently, um, every day, every week, how, whatever you can do um, and works for you, fantastic. Um, and if you can't do your whole route and um, happen to be on part of it, please enter what you see on um, the database, and, and I'll be going over the database um, after we go through some of these things. So, um, so again, numbers of observation is, is great. Um, timing, there's no required time of day. Um, however, if you're out early in the morning, you're likely to see more. Um, if you're driving, um, things won't be as, um, as scavenged or cleaned up, so you'll probably see things that were hit in the night that hadn't been cleaned up by scavengers yet. If you're walking, you'll have much more odds of seeing some of the small animals like the amphibians and reptiles. Um, they get, they dry up very, the amphibians in particular dry up very quickly and are scavenged by other animals very quickly in the morning. So, um, and if you are, if you are driving, you're likely not to see those small animals. Um, if you're walking, you have a much better chance of seeing those, um, particularly if you go out the day um, after a, a rain, uh, that rain at night. Um, and again, we're looking for both live and dead animal crossings. There's, I'll show you on the website, you can report both. Um, so let's see, speed. Um, when, if you're deciding to drive your route, and these are long routes, so you can choose for driving, you can do the entire section, or um, you can um, do a part of a section, whatever works for you. Um, but if you are driving, please uh, drive slowly. Um, so that you can see as much as possible. Um, um, if it's, but you want to be within the within the, what the uh, minimum um, uh, speed limit is for the road. If you have other drivers behind you, please let them pass safely. Um, and for identifying, be as specific as you can. As Chuck was saying, if you don't know what it is, you don't know what it is, and that's fine. Just reporting that it is a mammal or it was a bird or you think it's an amphibian, that's fine. That helps us as well. So, um, and we have an opportunity for you to say how confident it is. You're really confident. You 100% know what it is. You're somewhat confident or even best guess. Um, photographs. Please, um, as much as you can, take photographs. That's really, really, really helpful. We do go through them. And our biologists here, um, and working with IFNW, if it's a real tricky one, um, help us verify what species we're seeing. So if you don't know what it is, it's possible we will if we use a photograph. Um, we will send you a ruler. So as um, Chuck was saying, you know, size can be so deceiving. And if you can leave that in your car, uh, when you take a photograph, put the ruler down next to it, and that will give us a better idea of what, what size that animal that animal is and help us with identification. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, 
I'm going to go on to now when you again when you're out in the field, what you're going to do is um, you're going to have that map um, that you see up on your screen with you, and we'll send you a number of copies of that. And mark on there exactly as close as you can what um, what you do the number say number one observation, number two observation, and so on for your day. And then you're going to put it on your data sheet corresponding with the same number. Um, and there is, if you see a cluster of animals, um, you can use that as one observation if they're all the same species. Um, okay, I think Amanda can pull up the data sheet now so you can see what that looks like. Um, so again, um, so there's some turtles for you. We're going to slide down, go towards the end of these slides, um, all the way to the, to the end almost, and there's just some critters. Um, and there, okay, there's the data sheet, and this is available online actually, so you can always get more of them by, um, and I'll show you on, on the website where to find them and, and copy them, but we're also going to be sending um, you out a stack of them as well. Um, and so you'll be filling, filling those out with information, and, and the information on here pretty much corresponds with um, the information on the website. So just quickly going through it. Um, it's pretty obvious, you know, you put your name and the, 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 your route number, so you remember which route you're on, and the date of the observations. Um, if you know the temperature, that's fine, not critical. We like to know when, uh, when the, if it's been raining or not, um, general conditions. We like to know um, if you've surveyed the entire route or just part of the route. And what's really critical is if you do your entire route and see no wildlife, live or dead, check the box that says no wildlife observed and go to the website and enter that information in that you did that survey and saw nothing that is critical it's not intuitive but it really helps us with analyzing the data so the negative data or no data at all is also important information for us um, and i'll show you that on the website again you have your observation number and, and your photo number um, and someone had a question, observation points will vary. Um, and I'm not 100% sure, can, can you clarify, type a little more and clarify or, or speak up for, and clarify your question so I can answer that one. Uh, this is Dan here, you hear me? Hi Dan, yes. Yeah, so, so I, I just, I think I understand where you're going here, but um, so you, you will not, you're not, you're not, you're not anticipating we will establish um, observation points that we will repeat, but rather look for look for something to record and then uh, record it there and and then the next time we do the route it will be presumably in a different place. Exactly. So you're going to go, um, so you're driving your route and you see a raccoon. You'll mark on your map, this is where I saw the raccoon. And you can use the map that we give you or you could use your Delorum or you know, whatever works for you in order to identify its location so you remember when you go to put it into the website. So then, yeah, and then, and then you, you, you might want to, um, you know, this is optional, but you can, if you have a shovel in the back of your car or, um, you know, want to sort of shove the animal off the road um, or off the side of the road so that it's not counted again, by you or someone else, um, or by putting the scavenger at risk um, of uh, being next to the road. That's that's great. Not not required, but an optional thing. But yes, you, you mark your point um, for for entry onto the website, which we'll go over, and then go on and say maybe a few miles down, you see a skunk. You mark that on your map and keep going. The next time you go out, you're going to be using a fresh data sheet and a fresh map. And you may not see anything in that location. You may see something in a different location. Does that Understood. clarify? Understood. Yeah, that was that was my point. Um, it, as a similar point, if if I record um, no observations on the entire route, that's clear enough. Um, if I if I observe um, no observations on the partial route, I guess you'd want a map showing what 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 part of the route was observed. Yes. Oh, good point. Um, I see that on the data sheet. That's, it just popped into my head when I. Right. Um, hmm. 
I'm going to think about that, right, um, and, and get back to you on that, because I don't think there's a place on the website to say it was partially surveyed. So I think if it's partially surveyed and you saw nothing, I think we'll probably just not worry about it and not, not enter anything. I think only if you do the entire route. Okay? Just, just clarify Let's that for us, because uh, I'm sure that we'll get plenty of negative observations, right? Yeah. It'll, it'll really vary. Okay, a little more on the data sheet. Again, you know, the time you, the time you made the observation, um, the species, um, as far as you can tell, dead or alive, or if you saw more than one, how many. Sometimes you might see a whole bunch of frogs in the same location. Um, the, um, and, and there's sort of some tips on filling it out at the, on the opposite side of the sheet. But um, the, your confidence, best guess, 100% sure or, or um, somewhat confident. Um, a description of the location, and that simply means, um, you know, is it a dirt road, a gravel road, oh, I'm sorry, you know, house numbers, uh, culverts, any sort of description that might help you remember um, where, that, where that landmark is, or right after, you know, a certain road or a driveway, that kind of thing, to help you with the location. Then it's road type, whether it's paved or gravel, that kind of thing. There's a time since impact, so if you saw it happen, uh, or it was, uh, you think it's pretty fresh, less than 12 hours, or about a day, over a day, but under a week, and then over a week. Best estimate. It's fine if it's, you know, if you don't know, you don't know, and that's fine. Um, there's road features, and it's pretty self-evident. There's a list of them, and we also have some photographs of them. We're particularly interested in things like guardrails, fences, bridges and culverts, things that might influence how animals are moving or not moving, um, and that, that can be helpful. And when you're taking the photographs, you could also photograph um, the habitat. You know, you take a picture of the animal, one or two pictures of the animal, and then a picture of one side of the road and a picture of the other side of the road. And that gives us an idea of what kind of habitat we're talking about. Um, um, and if there's any other feature that you think is important, um, you can go ahead and take a picture of that as well. Okay, I think we're going to, oh, let's see. Let's go to, there's another, um, slide here. Yeah, go ahead. And go ahead one more. I have a um, question on that sheet. This is Carly. The, yep, go Carly. Um, where it says uh, observation number and then photo number. So uh, my first observation would obviously, I, I just put in number one, correct? You want us to start it that way? Exactly. And then with the photos, if they're numbered, um, you, you, are you going to be giving us further instructions as to how to submit those and how to number them? Because we're going to be sending them digitally, I assume. Exactly. They're on the website, and I'm going to demonstrate this, there's a place to okay. upload photos. So this is really for your, um, your um, organization. Um, so if you've got a digital camera and it's picture Notes number 99. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, then, got it. You know, or on your phone, and sadly, I think on the on the phones, they're quite long numbers, which is a bit tedious. But just a way for you to remember, okay, this is the picture for this observation. Got okay? it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and someone asked about um, um, the return route. Um, if you're walking, in particular. Um, we ask that you walk up one side of the road and back down the other because you will see different things um, on the road or along the shoulder of the road. If you're driving, um, you know, you may not, um, you, you may see what's on both sides of the road on, on the roads that we're talking about as you drive one direction. So it's not required to, to um, turn around and go the other direction. If you are and you see something different, great, but it's not a requirement. Does that, does that help you, Dan? So that's a yes or no. I observed it twice or I did not. Um, looking. It's a checkbox, right? So checkbox. I'm, I'm not clear when you want to check. Uh, where am I? Oh, observed on return on route. With, um, um, Let me give you an example. You know, well, I think, I think I, I let's ignore that. Of, so, so if I if I drive the route, I'm always going to drive it twice because I have to go home. Right. Um, I think we're going to ignore that checkbox. 
Um, I think it doesn't. Well, this was developed for for another um, uh, similar project, and I think it just is more confusing here than helpful. So um, we'll go ahead and ignore that. Yeah, or, or you can clarify it later. I just wanted to ask because it was right in front of me. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. And, and um, yep, okay. Um, last form I just wanted to alert you to. Um, Chuck mentioned some of these um, um, amphibians that were quite rare and, um, and how uncommon some of the reptiles are up in that region. So the, um, the biologists who, uh, England Fishery and Wildlife biologists who works on these species asked, it, uh, asked us to share with you, and Amanda will email this to you. It's a form where they um, record amphibians and reptiles. So if you see any reptiles, um, dead or alive, on the road or off the road, um, which would likely be things like the wood turtle, the snapping turtle, uh, et cetera, please take pictures and fill out this form and send it um, on up to um, Bangor Inland Fishery Wildlife Office. Um, they are eager for those kinds of records up in that part of the state. And the same for amphibians, particularly those rare species, but probably most species, um, if you can get a good picture of, of, um, of an amphibian, uh, whether you know what it is or not, uh, if you get some good pictures, they'll, they'll take a, and the location information, they'll, they'll take a good look at that and it might be important records um, uh, for their state database on, on amphibians and reptiles. So I just wanted to alert you to that and we'll send you the information. That's kind of a, another project that's going on, but they're very closely related. And Chuck, do you have a... Um, oh, and if you do have a GPS unit um, and know how to use it, <laughs> Take um, a GPS location for the animal that you've seen, uh, and that will be very helpful as well. And you can also, if you don't have a GPS unit and or both, you can click on the map that I'm going to show you on the website. Um, and even if it's an off-road occurrence, you can go ahead and use the Wildlife Road Watch website to, to, um, to put it in there, and we'll share that with IFNW as well. Okay. Now we're going to move over to the website, and we're going to do a little live ex um, uh, demonstration of how, how to get that information. Now you've gone out, you've done your surveys. Okay, now what? Now, now let's get that information shared. Okay, so this is what the website looks like. Um, the address, and again, we're going to send you links to all of this, but it's uh, wildlifecrossing.net forward slash main. Um, and again, we'll send you, there it is. Um, Amanda's highlighted it for us. Um, the first thing you're going to need to do is um, create a new account. If you aren't already a member, you'll click here on the right-hand part of the screen and um, create a new account. Pretty straightforward. You do this one time. Um, you fill in the um, form, particularly the things that are starred in red are required. You give yourself a display name, which can be your name or something else, your first name, your last name. Um, your username, which is something that we need. You need to send us your username because we won't necessarily, if it's something not um, intuitive, we might not know what it is. Your email address. And then the other information is optional, contact address. By clicking on the gray bar, you can let us know your experience and, and uh, that's helpful. You do this kind of um, spam protecting little thing. Click on the new, Create New Account button. And then the system will send you an email with a temporary password. And you click on that link and create yourself a new password. And then you've got your username and password, and you're set uh, and never have to do that again. So I'm going to go back to the home page, and I'm going to actually type in a username, I hope and log in. So username, password, click log in. And here is what it will look like once you have your account. You will start, you will get some op uh, opportunities to enter data. Uh, and, before I, and before I demonstrate that, I just want to sort of orient you a little bit. Um, we have news here on this page where you can see, oh, here's the Western Mountains project and other projects. Uh, there's a blog opportunity where you can, if you see some interesting things, you can <coughs> share it with um, all the other people on the, on the program and um, they can um, 
then comment on that, and that's always very interesting. You can click and see a map of all of the observations. Um, these are all in the last three months, or um, maps. You can actually click on that, and it will give you a um, identification number. That's a snowy owl. Click on the link, and it will tell you a little bit more about it. And if there was a photo, um, that would pop up too. So you can just explore information other people have shared. Um, or you can look at it. Uh, whoops. Those are all the animals that uh, you might encounter. This is the data, just in a list form instead of the map form. And over here, again, on the right, you'll see my observations and my maps. When you click on those, it will just show you your data without the rest of um, the volunteers' data. So you can sort of get keep a handle on your own data. And you can play around with this um, as much as you like. Um, so a little orientation. So now, say so you've done your route and you've made an observation. You're going to be able to choose. And actually, let me back up. Um, the thing you're going to need to do before, beforehand is you're going to be telling Amanda which of those routes you're going to survey um, on, on the overview map. Um, and you're going to be giving us your username. And we'll need both of that because you will not see this no wildlife observation um, choice um, when you register until we ass assign you your route, and then that will pop up. So we're going to need that information first, and we'll be emailing you back and forth about that. Um, so OK, so now you've done your route, um, and you've made an observation. So you'll click on, I'm going to enter my observation. Dead, it's a dead observation. And I'll just walk you through. It's the exact same thing for live, live wildlife observation but you would click on the live wildlife. And that's how we know if it was something that you saw running across the road or uh, dead on the road. So the first thing you do is go to animal, and you type in um, what you saw. So let's see, wood. And I have a lot of these. So you start typing, and some options are going to come up. And in this case, it was actually a wood frog, we'll say. If you have no idea. If you have a best guess, you can write it in in the write-in section instead, either or, up to you. But then you do need to click on whether it's an amphibian, a bird, or a mammal. Um, if, you're, you, if you want to be more specific, you can um, open, open up the plus sign here. I'll say if it was a, uh, uh, well, here it was an amphibian, and it was a frog. Don't need to do that. You could just stop at amphibian. It's really up to you. Um, keep going. This is this is important and required. Is how confident you are. 100% um, certain. Some went. Or I'm going to say it was pretty flattened, so it was my best guess. Okay. Then you go to um, and every time you open up these boxes, it's these gray bars. You click on them to open them up. Monitoring. This is when if you've made an observation on your route or anywhere in the state, because we take observations anywhere in the state. They don't have to be a specific survey route. Um, but the way we know it was done during one of your specific surveys is when is by you clicking on this monitoring. So if you've got a route, you've done your route with the maps, you, it's very important to click on the monitoring and then check off the box that will be the name of your route that it's signed. And that won't be there until, again, you give us your username and we, and we assign you your route. But once we do that, then you'll be, have that option. Click that. Then where? Now this is the real power of this, this project, is that uh, now, all of a sudden, we can get location data from everyone um, everywhere around the state. You'll type in the name of your road. Um, we'll just say Route 1. Um, and then you interface with the map. Um, and I'll just, you know, I'll assume, I know many of you probably already know how to use this kind of map from Google Maps on, and, and driving directions, but I'll, I'll just start from the beginning um, and show you how this particular map works. So here's, it comes in as the state of Maine. And so you put the, you push, click on the cursor and hold the map down by holding down the cursor on the, the click on the map, the mouse, the mouse uh, clicking button. And up around. So try and put the area that you're surveyed in the middle. And then you can either um, use the wheel of the mouse to scroll in or out. You can use the little plus buttons. And now I'm getting a little off center, so I'm going to move the map over. 
and click the plus button again, or you can use this little bar and see here, and I can pull it up. Whoops, it went way too far up. I didn't like that, so I'm going to pull it down again. And that happens. Let's see. There we go. I'm using the mouse cursor. Much better. Um, okay, so let's see. Okay, here's one of the routes. Whoops, went way too far. Let me go back in. Scroll in, scroll in. Here's one of the routes, Route 16. And I'm going in again. Then you can, if you look at this on the right hand top, there's this thing that looks like a sheet of stack of sheet of papers. You click on that, you get an option of how you want um, the map to look. So I like Google Maps Hybrid. Click on the little button, and now you get the aerial photo. And you can close that so it's not in your way. And then I can zoom in, zoom in my map, zoom in. So I can really find, oh yeah, it was on this curve of the road where I saw it. You know, you can see the of the of the landscape. See, so it was okay. I think it was pretty much right here. I go up again to the right hand side, there's a pencil with a plus sign. Click on that, and then click on the map where you thought you saw it, and it puts down a little pin, a little red box with a plus sign on it. I don't like where that is, no problem. I say, oh, that wasn't quite right. It was actually I saw it over here. And you can do that until you get it to the place that you're happy with. Okay. Um, and then, so that's just putting it on the map. And that's really, you know, the, the power is that here, you know, you've made an observation. And now I and us using the database that's being created here have that geographic information um, locked in. And we can then um, do GIS computer analysis of all that information where it's in the landscape. And the next thing is you can, uh, it puts in today's date. So if you had did it a week before, you just go in and say, oh, actually, it wasn't 07. It was on the 1st. Um, and you change the date. The time is a 24-hour clock. So if I saw that at 1 o'clock, I'd type in my um, 13, 13, and it was actually uh, 13, 15. And you don't have to be you don't have to be as precise as, as exact minutes, but if it was around three, you know, around one o'clock or one fifteen, that kind of thing, um, if you have exact time, that's fine too. The next are your visual uploads. Okay, this is where we were talking about putting your pictures. So the first thing you need to do is get your pictures onto your computer from your camera or your phone. Put them in a folder. Once they're there on your computer, you can go to browse. And then I don't know if there are any pictures on this particular um, uh, computer. I'll go under pictures and see if there's any. Oh, sample pictures, fabulous. Oh, cute koala. So if you saw what I did, I, maybe I should go back. I went a little fast. Um, I went to the folder where there are pictures, clicked on it, um, and then I opened it. Whoops. Opened it. And then I picked the picture. And you do have to do this one picture at a time. Click the Open button. Now it's got the link here. And I just hit the Upload button. Be smaller than um, 8 megabytes per picture. And these are the formats that are allowed, JPEG, uh, GIF, PNG, and JPEG. And there it is. And now it's uploaded. And you can give it a title. If you want, um, if there's any information, or, but you don't have to. That's optional. Um, and then if you have another photo, maybe the habitat, you can say habitat on this side of the road, habitat on that side. You go through the same process until you upload all your files, all your photographs. OK, the last section are the field notes. Um, you don't necessarily, it depends on um, some of these you fill out. The animal count you only use if you seen a cluster of dead animals, like maybe a family of raccoons all in the same location. You see three of them. Um, it defaults to one animal, so you don't have to do this if you just made, saw one animal. But if say you saw three, you click here, you type in your three, um, you're done. If you're not 100% sure how many there were, it was a range. It was like, well, it was between two and four, or 20 and 50. You know, you can give the range. Um, the animal specific information, again, is um, if you know the gender, most, most of the time you won't, so you just leave that blank. 
Um, if you know the age, um, is it a juvenile or adult? Um, most of the, you know, most of the time, um, you, that's a, an optional field. But if you have that information, go ahead and put it in. Um, the uh, time since death um, was on the field um, on the form, and here are the options again. You click on those, and roadway specific is where you put in um, that you were either driving or on a bike or walking and so forth. So say we were in a car car this time. How often you travel the road. Um, this is particularly helpful when you're doing a random observation rather than your, your survey, but, but also um, it can be useful. You go there daily. The type of road. That's dirt, local paved. Um, these are, you know, single lanes. This is just, you know, uh, one one lane in each direction, or four lanes, uh, state highway, interstate, and the roadside features we were talking a bit about. Again, was these are the different guardrails, types, the median barriers, curbs. Is there a curb on the road? Culverts, bridges, fences, and we have pictures of those in the instructions that we're going to uh, make sure you have uh, a link to or a copy of. Any field notes, anything you need to share about uh, special circumstances, um, you put here. And then the last bit is you just hit the Save button, and it will save your record. I'll sit, say I probably didn't put in all the required information, so it'll probably give me a little error message. Oh, no, I did it. And it's created, and you're done. Um, and that, and there's the, there's the picture of the koala. Boy, we're going to really confuse the biologists when we're, when we're reviewing this data. That'll be fun. Um, so that's that's the end of um, the website demonstration. Um, questions that are percolating about um, using the website or anything else we've been discussing uh, so far. Um, yeah. we're, we're pretty much. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, so if we have the written sheet. Uh, we take our notes on that. Then you enter the data in the um, in the website. That we we can destroy the written sheet. We don't need to mail those in. Is that correct? Um, so I would request it's it's really up to you, but I would request that you hold on to them for six to eight months. Um, because if we are going through the data and have questions, we might want to contact you. Um, and, and verify um, if, if something comes up. So if, you, if, if you're able to, that would be really helpful to hold on to them for, you know, um, six, eight months, uh, giving us a chance to get through all the data. Um, also, because we'll probably hold off looking at this data until um, fall or winter. Um, and sometimes, for some people, they've found um, if, if they've had some difficulty with entering the data, again, we can help over the phone uh, with that. or um, even uh, enter the data for you um, if it really is starting to, you know, just build up um, or you get busy or, you know, some people are more savvy with the computer than others. So um, in that case, you can send us in the data sheets, but that's not required. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about birds. Uh, uh, you know, two turkeys in the, in the ditch are, are an obvious observation, but um, Chickadees, uh, little unidentified brown birds at a distance. Uh, right. Good question. Um, so we're really looking for things that are inter that are interfacing with the road that um, look like there might be some issues with um, either crossing or getting hit. So birds up high, you know, soaring overhead, not really looking for. Um, a bird, a, a hawk perched right next to the road looking like they're going to pounce on something, yes, that would be helpful. Or an owl, you know, sometimes they fly low right in front of the car in the dusk. Um, yep, that would be interesting to know. Um, or, uh, or a, excuse me, crows. Uh, you know what, I wouldn't bother with the crows. I mean, they're really fascinating, but I think they're so um, common and scavenge along the roads that it's not going to really tell us anything. Um, about the behavior of the turn. What's that? Oh, the crows will tell you that there's a roadkill coming up. Yeah, <laughs> right. And so you might keep your eyes open in that circumstances. Eagles keep a keep a close eye 
on. You may have heard in the news um, that um, in some parts of the state there's a real problem with eagles who are scavenging on roadkill um, and, and um, concern. And I don't know, Chuck, have some gotten hit um, also? Yes. Yeah. So we've had some bald eagles getting hit because they are scavenging dead animals on the roadside and they can't, or along the, on the road, and they can't get up and fly quickly like a crow. Um, it's very difficult for them to take off that quickly. Um, so you might see something like that and reporting that would be very helpful. Um, a cluster of turkeys. What's that? Oh, sorry, that brings up a, a, a related thought. Um, if, if, uh, well, crows tell you that there's a roadkill, and I know that sometimes the roadkill will be off the road, you know, deer and moose. Uh, is there a, have you thought about defining the corridor? I mean, do you, you want an observation in the ditch? Do you want an observation just outside the ditch, alongside the road? Uh, is, there's got to be a limit there, right? Right. Good, good, good thought. Um, so we don't have a specific distance because it will vary circumstantially, but certainly anything that's on the shoulder of the road or a ditch that's associated with the road, um, we would definitely want um, anything, you know, sometimes it's an open field area. Um, so if something's sort of headed towards the road, um, but it's quite a bit ways off, go ahead and include that. Um, I think that that's very helpful. I don't know if Chuck has any thoughts on that and any particular species, but um, we do want um, anything that feels like it might interface with the road. If it's, um, you know, sometimes an animal will get hit and kind of get flung a little bit from the road, and so scanning for that is helpful. Uh, it sounds like you're telling me if I can see it from the road, you're interested. Pretty much, pretty much. You know, unless again it's a songbird um, that's pretty far from the road and, and not looking, you know, just doing its thing up in the trees. Um, so to you know, terrestrial um, animals um, yes. that, are, that are visible from the road. Yes, yep. Better to be inclusive in that case um, is helpful. Um, and, I, and I guess I want to reiterate, I showed you how to, you know, I, I actually went off the website prematurely. Um, I mean, if you bring that back up, I, it reminded me just a couple things. Thanks for the question. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that we, I had demonstrated the dead animal um, recording, but you also have the identical recording sheet, and I'm not going to go through it, for um, live animal here. Um, but also, the, I wanted to um, show you the no wildlife observation. You've done your entire route and you saw nothing. It was just the, everything had been cleaned up or everything, nothing had happened. You do click on there and this is what it comes up, very much more simplified. All you have to do is check that that was your route that you surveyed. You enter the when information and your any field notes you want to share. Yeah, I went out, but I didn't see anything and you know so forth. We also have, you'll see, a section that's called Wildlife Tracks and Signs Observation. Um, we're not really using this for our analysis at this point, but it is um, something that, it, you know, if you do see something interesting, you can, you have the opportunity to, to observe that. And, and um, we haven't decided what we may do with this over time, but spore type means some sort of animal sign, so feather, fur, hair, tracks, scat, and so forth. Um, but it, again, it's not something we're going to be really using for our analysis, but I just thought I'd let you know that it, that it is there because you will run across it and see it. I also wanted to let you know, um, you'll see this add adopt a route, road route here. Um, we've already identified the routes for this project, but this is for people who want to create their own route. There may be another route that they just go regularly and they're really gung-ho and they really want to um, you know, do a lot of surveys. Um, there's an opportunity to actually go in, name and route, and draw the route. You need to share that back with us, um, and it, said, it gives directions right on the website. Um, and and um, not part of this project, but I just thought you'll see that when you look at the website and wonder what it is. Um, but anybody who wants to do their own route certainly can. Great. I'm done with that. Thanks. More questions? Mm -hmm. Super. Oh, we did have a question from Lloyd. Uh -huh. Lloyd, let me see. Um, 
question whether like an okay. iPhone 5 uh, takes GPS points. I mean, I don't know how to do it, but. Yeah, you know what, that's a really good question. I don't either. I do know that some of the smartphones and iPhones, they definitely do have GPS. So if yeah. you're savvy uh, and can figure. Yeah, your iPhone does. Your iPhone does have a GPS, and and with the with the right app, you can you can record points. Whether that'll be helpful here or not, uh, they they've got a very nice um, sort of a point and click interface, which I, yeah. I suspect will be easier than trying to transcribe um, you know X Y data. Exactly, and we do not. It does not have the capability to upload GPS locations. Someday we might add that, but but um, we we haven't done that. Uh, at this stage. Um, but again, if you see one of those rare amphibians or reptiles, the GPS location is very useful um, for, for, for those biologists. Uh, I'll you, Deloitte, if, if, if you have, anticipate using your iPhone for GPS uh, in the areas in, where they have the routes, you're going to need to, to purchase uh, one of the GPS apps that, that allows you to download map data into memory because you're not going to have a live um, uh, cell phone link, so it's not going to work, you know, in, re in real time otherwise. Uh, that's possible, but it may be easier to use just a, 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 a basic GPS unit just to keep track of where you're at. And Chuck, ha and Chuck has a comment for us on this. I have a Garmin for my personal truck that's three years old, uh -huh. a dash model, yeah, and I can pick a waypoint on that. Okay. So if people have a a dedicated GPS for the vehicle probably will take a waypoint. Okay. Did you all hear that about? Uh, but then you do have to translate that into where that is on a map, um, and then point and click on our website. So, other thoughts and questions. You, you you've got two um, identified routes up this way. I mean, do you have notions about? who you want on which route and how well you're covered. Have you thought that through? Um, I, I have some yes. questions for one of your routes because I'm looking at it at the moment. Um, but um, there's another one to the west of town that I wonder if you need help with. So we would like people to choose the route. We want as many people as possible on each route. And we're not going to uh, limit it to just you know two or three volunteers per route because we're really trying to get a lot of data. And we do have a way of sort of telling if we're getting duplicate information. So um, better more information than less. And um, you are completely welcome to choose the route that you know is going to be best for you. Um, and if you know people who might do the other route, um, or even your route as well, um, please um, um, encourage them to to uh, join in. And I also want to encourage, again, those random observations that you or, or your friends make that are not associated with the route um, are also going to be useful over time as well. Thank you. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll communicate with you. I don't know if anybody wants to say right now which route they want to do, and Amanda will make a note of that, but she'll also be communicating you via email to, to firm that up. Well, yeah, I, I can certainly guarantee attention to the Route 4 route um, because it's right here. Uh, I, I, if, if you need help with the route over by Richardson, um, let me know, and I'll, I'll try to work some in. I might not be able to guarantee full coverage of it. Great. And that's Dan. Is that Dan? Yes, this is Dan. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. And no one has to commit today to their route, but um, you can share that if you like. Um, good. I think that is, we're a little over time. I don't I want to respect people's time. Um, I think we've covered most anything, everything. Uh, again, we're going to be sending you both physical information and emailing you some information. Um, if questions come up, please contact uh, me or Amanda. Um, and I really, really appreciate your time this morning to join us and, and learn about the project. And I really want to thank uh, Chuck, who's sitting over here, for uh, his yeah. time and, and expertise. I really learned uh, quite a bit listening to him um, with his local knowledge and, and real deep knowledge of some of these animals. So I greatly appreciate that. Uh, any final farewells or questions before we sign off? 
Uh, just uh, will you be sending us the link for logging on and creating our um, uh, our account on the on the website then? Yes, we will. And do we have everybody's email address? I would assume. Yeah, and I can send them directly to that link when we close out the webinar. Great. So she will send you directly to the link when we close out the webinar, but we'll also send you a follow-up email with, with um, the link and all the information you need to get started. Thank you. That's all I have. Great. Okay. Well, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday and uh, look forward to hearing your report about your reports from the road. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.